Amen. So justification, it's a word that we don't often hear outside of the church walls. Inside the church walls, it typically refers to our standing before God, as in do we have a right standing or do we not? And as well, it often might elicit the question of, well, how do you obtain a right standing before God? And while you might not hear this term all that often outside of the church walls, it's not in our everyday vernacular, at the same time, our culture is inundated with the concept of justification. Here's an example. You have a boss who calls an employee into his or her office to inquire about a recent purchase. How can you justify spending $5,000 on a cappuccino maker? Or perhaps in the news, we hear about one group being in opposition to another group, even to the point of violence. And the first group says that this violence was justified because the second group was a known hate group. Or in the political arena, you have quite often the media or the public demanding that leaders justify their actions and their policies. And we ourselves are not immune from the justification game. We look at that second piece of cake and go, well, I did work out yesterday for five minutes, so I think I earned it. Or we say, man, that was a really rough week. I'm going to treat myself to those new pair of shoes or that new Apple product or anything else that we've been eyeing and maybe saving up for, maybe not. No, almost on a daily basis, we justify something or another. And sadly, all too often, actually, we look to a different form of justification in that we justify our very existence. That is, that we live, breathe, have our being, and are blessed the way that we are blessed. We might think to ourselves, yeah, it makes sense that I have the life that I have. And so we might do this in multiple ways. We might look to our merits and say, you know, I mean, it makes sense that I have the life that I have. I'm, I'm a pretty nice person to everybody that I meet, or, you know, I provide for my family and I care for them, or, you know, I'm in, uh, you know, I uh, just do nice things. Or as well, it might be part of our character that we think, yeah, you know, I give to the poor regularly, or, you know, I'm intelligent, or, you know, I'm pretty slow to anger, or I'm really good at problem solving. Or it might even be based upon what we believe. It might be our political beliefs, it might be our philosophical beliefs, or we might even put an inappropriate trust in our spiritual beliefs as to the source of why we are blessed the way that we are. And of course, sometimes we compare ourselves to others and we think, yeah, it makes sense that I have the life that I have, that I, you know, breathe and I'm blessed the way that I'm blessed because, well, I'm clearly better than those people. But all of this is to ignore the reality that we profess in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, Luther gives an explanation as to what this means and the scope of what we profess with these words. He says, I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, my eyes, my ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. You see, a created invention gains its value from the inventor. And so to we, as well, we who have been created by God, our existence is justified by the Creator. But this Creator didn't just create us and then leave us. No, Luther continues by saying, He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home. He gives me relationships of my family and friends. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. And so Luther offers in his explanation as to what our response should be in light of these truths. He says, We, therefore, are to thank and praise and serve and obey God. Now, what does that mean, that we should serve and obey God? Well, it means that we should follow his commandments. 
And earlier, we heard the reading from Exodus where God gave some of his commandments to us. And Jesus summed up those commandments as well by saying you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But the problem is that these commandments, as well as all the other commandments of God, we fail to keep. We don't trust, we don't thank and praise God as we ought to, and we don't serve and obey God as we were created to. And what is more, in our sinful state, we cannot follow what God has designed us to do. Now, if an invention fails to perform what it's designed to do, and it cannot be repaired, then its existence is no longer justified, and it is destined for destruction. And similarly, we do not act in accordance to our design. Our existence by ourselves, by our own merits, are not justified, and we deserve destruction. And this gets a little bit more into what we commonly talk about with justification. And so we saw in the gospel lesson the young man who sought to justify himself and his existence to say, see, I am a value. I can gain eternal life by myself. I've done all these things. But the problem is that that young man, as well as each and every one of us, we don't truly fear, love, and trust in God above all things. For him, it was his money that he held on to tightly. And for many of us, often it's, to be honest, ourselves that we put before the place of God. I had a professor at Concordia Seminary who used to give this analogy with respect to justification. He said that a husband who comes in after 2 a.m. for the third night in a row to an upset wife would do well to do nothing to defend himself. And yet, all too often, he tries to give some kind of an explanation. He says, oh, I, you know, I, I intended to get home much earlier, but I, I just couldn't help the circumstances. You see, my, my buddy at the bar, he had just a little too much to drink, and I really had to make certain that he got home safe, and on and on the story goes, all as a means of trying to get his wife to forgive him. Or maybe he tries the comparison approach. He says, well, you know what, at least I tell you where I'm going and who I'm going to be there with, and I didn't spend that much money, you know, so are we cool? <laughs> or maybe he tries the bargaining approach. He says, oh, I, you know what, I, I know I messed up, but I tell you what, tomorrow night we're going to go to your favorite restaurant, all right, and you put on that fancy dress that I know you like so much, I'm going to buy you a brand new necklace to go with it, I'll put on my suit. How does that sound? Or he dare not go to the last place of supposed superiority over his wife by saying, you know what, I am the man of this house. Who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? The truth of it is that none of these attempts to justify will appease an upset wife. And what is worse, it's more likely to cause further problems. No, the best thing that he can do is to recognize the reality of the situation, that he is at his wife's mercy, and that if she will forgive him, it will not be because of him. Not because of his character, not because of the good things that he's done in the past, and not because of the good things that he promises to do in the future. And so it too, it also is often with us and God. See, we try the good intentions route. We say, oh God, I really intended to be a good person, but... You know, I wasn't really certain if that person in need was genuinely in need or if they were trying to scam me. Or as well, my water heater broke, and so I couldn't really afford to help those people in need. And also, I've been swamped at work, and oh my gosh, I just couldn't put forth the mental energy to be a good person anymore. <laughs> or we try the comparison route, and we say, well, God, at least I go to church pretty regularly, and I pray from time to time, and, you know, I pull out my Bible and read from it a few times a year, so... Are we good? <laughs> or they try the bargaining approach and they say, God, uh, you know, I know I messed up, but if you would just forgive me and bless me, then I promise I'm going to go to church every single week and I'm going to read my scripture every single day and I'm going to pray twice a day. How does that sound? 
Or unfortunately, they go for the supposed superiority route and think, look, God, I know I messed up, but all right, I know I failed to help those people, but you let all those people die, and you could have stopped that. So who are you to judge me? But honestly, the best thing for us to do is to recognize the reality of our situation, that we are at God's mercy, and it will not be because of us that he forgives us. It won't be because of our character. It won't be because of the good things that we did in the past or the good things that we promise to do in the future. Now, the good news that I have for you today is that we have been justified before God and that we are forgiven. Not because we follow the design of our creator, but rather because God provided what was necessary for an update. You see, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And one way of understanding grace is God's favor. A favor being an act of kindness beyond what is due. And so you have been saved by this creator's act of kindness beyond what we deserve. And this was done through faith, which can also be understood as the trust and the promise that God's promise is true. Specifically, the promise that he gives us that we are forgiven of our faults because of the Son of God. Now, this faith, this trust as well, is not even from us as well. It is from God as a gift and not by our works. So to sum all this up, we failed to do what we were designed to do, to thank, praise, serve, and obey God. This God who created us and sustains us and provides for us. But he also provided for us the means by which we can be reconciled to him, the means by which we could be justified before him, the means by which we could have a right standing with him. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross after living a perfect life and rising from the grave. And what he has done is credited to us, not by our merits, but by a gift. And so because of this, what is more, we actually now can live as God designed us to, to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Amen. We stand and confess.